And joining me now is Christian Mitchell, representative for the 26th District in Illinois, uh, and City of Chicago, uh, being your district. Welcome to the show, Representative. Good Thanks to, for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. Good to see you again. So we're going to talk about education because that's, okay. that's critical for you and critical right now in the state. But first, yes, I, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what's going on because, you know, last week in Springfield, there actually looked like some hope that some things would get accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to ask you about one bill, Marty Moylan's bill, which basically said, let's get the lottery winners paid. Let's let's not use general appropriations money mm -hmm. and let's take care of a lot of stuff that needs to be taken care of. Everybody supported it. Looked great. Only one no vote. And then the House, you sit in the House, put a brick on it. Why? Well, look, it's my understanding uh, that, you know, it's a bill that has a lot of stuff that people would support, but I think the governor's office wanted to kind of make some last minute additions. And so uh, what I think we were told was that there, those would be reviewed and potentially attached as an amendment and pending that we were going to hold the bill. So I don't know much more about it than that other than what we were told. Okay, so my understanding is it's Barbara Flynn Curry that, that did that little procedural move to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate, I know Senator Christine Redonio had said we were ready to move on it, ready to, uh, to vote for that. Um, so while that may be true, it just seems to me a little awkward that it would be the House Democrats that were saying, oh, okay, Governor, we'll give you some time. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't the, the, the method of the Democrats, certainly under the Madigan rule, to say, let's move it, let's make this happen, let's make him deal with stuff? Uh, you'd have to ask the Speaker and, and Barbara Curry about, about the specifics of what happened there. I, you know, the bill came up for a vote, and I think a lot of people supported it, but whatever happened, happened, and you'd have to ask them about that. Okay. And then one of your other Democratic colleagues, Ken Duncan, uh, certainly got himself into hot water last week. Not according to him. I mean, he yeah. thinks he kind of saved the day. Maybe he did. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get your take on that. But with regard to the, um, uh, the child Child care bill. He says he negotiated a deal with the governor um, to put lots more people uh, under the under increase the uh, uh, the funding there and, um, and and try and resolve the problem. And so that's why um, he didn't vote in favor of overriding the governor's veto, which would have prevented the governor from playing with those rules anymore mm -hmm. and trying to adjust the qualifications. What, what's your take on what Representative Duncan did and what happened? Well, I can't speak to what Ken did. What I can say is this, which is um, we're in a situation where you've had a governor whose position on child care has kind of fluctuated wildly. His initial budget proposal had cut it, but then there was the fiscal, fiscal year 15 fix, which tried to increase it, and then finally he did this draconian rule change unilaterally. And so I think for many of us in the House, the question was, how how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? So I've got child care providers in my district right now that are shutting down. We've got businesses in my district that are adjusting the way they do shifts because you've got so many single moms who are being crushed by the fact they don't have child care anymore. So for us, voting on Senate Bill 570, of which I was a chief co-sponsor, was insurance to say the governor can never do something like this again. And so we wanted to make sure that that was, was going to be the case, that there'd be certainty for our businesses, for our families, for single moms in my district and around the state. And that's why we thought the bill needed to go on the board. You know, as for Representative Duncan and the deal that he, that he thinks he cut. Well, all I would say is this. When you've got a governor who made the decision to cut the program in the first place and has shifted his position so many times, I'm not going to take a 30% chance on the fact that the governor is going to hold the line on making sure working moms have access to this crucial program. So we've got to make sure going forward that he can't make those sorts of cuts, and that's why we wanted to pass the bill. Uh, one other thing, and I'm not trying to stir anything up between you and, and Duncan or you and anybody else, sure. um, but I thought it was interesting that Duncan, rather than being a no vote, I mean, if that's what you're doing, you struck a deal, well, then vote no and, and tell us why. He wasn't there. He just kind of stepped out and didn't vote. Um, there, now, there is in Illinois a way to, you know, to vote president, and, and there's reasons yeah. for it, but I'm just curious. Do you have a reaction to that of just not voting? No, you'd have to ask Ken again. He was at his, he was at his desk when the, when the vote went down, mm -hmm. and he made a choice, and every legislator gets elected by 108,000 people in their district, and they have to answer their constituents on what they do and don't do. Okay. Sounds like you're not happy that it didn't pass. I'm not. I'm certainly okay. not it didn't pass. Look, uh, again, there are people in my district right now who are relying on this program, yeah. and they have hanging over their head that, you know, the governor may stick his finger in the air at some point and decide that this is something he can use to try to hold, you know, Democrats or other people hostage to whatever thing he wants on that day. And that's not the kind of thing that I think makes sense. I think it's irresponsible, and I wanted the bill to pass for that reason. All right. Let's talk about education. It's very important to you, specifically House Bill 4272. Um, the, what's interesting about this bill to me is there's a lot of things that are trying to be accomplished in this bill that I think a lot of people think it's the way it is anyway. Um, yeah. So let, let's, let's talk to me in general. What's the mission of 4272? So the, the, the 4272, which is the Fund Education First Bill, is, is to me a sustainable path forward for funding public education in the state of Illinois the way it's intended to be funded. It effectively does three things. One is, say, we're going to put 55% of all new state revenues toward education until we reach our constitutional obligation of 51%. Now, every politician, they probably sat with you, they talked to people on the street, and they say, education is my number one priority. 
let's go put our money about where our mouth is and says, let's make sure new revenue coming in goes towards ed education. Second thing it does is a continuing appropriation for education so that it can't be cut. So right now you've got Governor Rauner effectively saying, I'll help CPS, I'll help Chicago, but only if you give me these things that bust unions and hurt working people. So he's holding the city of Chicago and state of Illinois hostage to his agenda. This would prevent that from happening. Third and final thing is a responsible pension cost shift. And what I want to say first is what that doesn't do. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't do is shift that cost onto teachers. What it doesn't do is take money out of the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. What it does do is say, let's end this free lunch for these very wealthy suburban school districts who are giving $800 million away to every single year, reinvest that money into public education. That's $200 million for CPS next year. And it's also money not just for CPS, but for downstate districts like Cahokia, East St. Louis, Marion, Alexander, places that are not just have urban poverty, but have rural poverty. So so many of our brothers and sisters around the state would benefit from this bill. To me, it is a long-term solution to the education funding crisis we have in Illinois. One of the biggest problems you have whenever you're playing with pensions at all when it comes to teachers, of course, is there's Chicago the rest of the state. That's right. And so whenever you try and shift that burden, you have everybody outside of Chicago mm -hmm. saying, wait a minute, now you're killing us. Now, now because right. we still have bills to pay, our rates are going to go up. It sounds like your bill is an attempt to, to um, weaken that argument. Well, I think that's right. And I think part of it is, look, there are some districts that have cash reserves that are having contentious school board meetings about whether they put in their second or third Olympic-sized swimming pool. And then you've got districts like mine and with, with schools that don't have libraries, don't have proper books, don't have desks. And so what we're saying is, look, for those folks who have a lot, yes, you're going to pay a little bit more. But if you, in most cases, even raised your levies and still stayed under the state average for what the property tax rate is, you could recoup your losses. Whereas places like Chicago or Cahokia or East St. Louis or Marion or Alexander could not save themselves with their, with their own levy. So the state should be constitutionally providing more money for education. Massachusetts, other states that do this extraordinarily well, they do so. So if we want to be a leader in this, if we want to sustainably fund education, we have to find creative ways to do so. And this is my idea. You know, everything that uh, you know, the lottery was supposed to be all for education, right? Yeah. Until it wasn't. And every time there's going to be any kind of cut or we're going to lower taxes, look out, educate. That's every politician's favorite line, education out the window. Yeah. Is, is this bill a way to say enough of that? Now yeah. when we put dollars, we mean it, you can't mess with it. It is. And, and I'm glad you asked that question, Paul, because one of the mistakes that was made on the lottery, there are two mistakes. One is um, that's money that kind of flattens out. It's, it's basically money that should be used for pensions or for capital because it shouldn't be used to fund sustainable programs over time. But the second reason is it wasn't earmarked for general state aid. This bill says specifically, take the money from the pension cost shift, take the money from that uh, increased appropriation, put that directly in education. It would be done in statute by law so that money couldn't be appropriated anywhere else. Let me also ask you, the, uh, the leaders were supposed to meet this week. They're not because of a death in the Madigan family. It's been pushed to December 1st. How much hope do you have that uh, when the leaders get together with the first hour being on television, uh, we can accomplish the budget? Well, my hope is that the meeting helps move the process forward by making sure that everyone publicly understands the position that each leader is taking. I think that we can have disagreements, we can have agreements, but ultimately we've got to make sure we move our state forward in a way that makes a lot of sense. The only problem I have, for example, with some of the stuff the governor is saying isn't that we're not willing to take tough votes. What Governor Rauner will say is if Democrats would take tough votes, we could solve this problem. Look, I've taken tough votes and, and had difficult primaries because of it. The issue is there's no evidence the stuff that he says he wants to do works. Incredible evidence that it doesn't. When you look at Wisconsin and how their wage growth is declining and how employment has contracted, you see that some of the stuff he's proposing on right to work doesn't work. When there are national studies saying our worker compensation costs are already going down, we're already kind of on a path for some of the stuff he says he wants to do. So we're not going to continue we're not going to be able to move forward as a state if we don't get realistic about what works and what doesn't and how we get that stuff on the table. Very quickly, any reaction? The governor said this week uh, we're not going to allow Syrian refugees to come to the state of Illinois, taking the legalities out of it. I don't think you can do that, but that being said, what's yeah. your thought about that in a nation of immigrants? Well, I do think it's important to say that, you know, just there is the supremacy clause of the Constitution which says that might not be something he can do. I would just say that, you know, in some ways, every single one of us who's here often came from a distant shore. And today's immigrants are often tomorrow's leaders. So I don't want to see us given to the kind of xenophobia or Islamophobia that in fact gives rise and sympathy to some of the organizations that we've seen around the world. We have to make sure that we are safe and secure and I respect uh, the governor insofar as that's what he's looking to do, but we cannot become a, a nation that rejects immigrants given everything uh, that immigrants have meant to this country. Representative Christian Mitchell, thanks for coming in. Thanks I appreciate it. Me. We'll see you again soon and sure. we'll be back with more politics tonight in just a moment. Stay with us.